Hi everyone um, and welcome to Secure an Investment to Grow Your Tech Startup. Um, my name's Cole and I work in the tech venture team at Development Bank. Uh, we've created this event as part of Wales Tech Week to help shed some light on the investment journey. Now, if there's one thing we seem to love in the investment world more, uh, more than anything else, it's three letter acronyms or TLAs. So if you hear anything this morning that makes you think WTF, does that mean? then throw it into the chat function and we will do our best to get it answered uh, in the event or shortly afterwards. And today's event is broken into two main parts. Firstly, you're gonna hear um, from some of my colleagues um, uh, taking you from early stage seed through to exit uh, in 45 minutes. And then secondly, you'll hear from a panel of founders from some amazing companies we've invested into so you can hear the personal experiences of building a company using equity investment. Okay, so with no further ado, I'll uh, hand you over to my colleague, Carl Griffiths, who will kick things off with a look at the early stage seed end of investments. Thank you, Colin. Um, my name is Carl Griffiths, and I look after the technology seed fund in the Development Bank of Wales. I've been doing this for the last four years or so, so I joined the bank back in 2016. But for the 16 years prior to that, I set up and ran my own high-tech um, businesses. The first one in North Wales, based up in St. Asaph, and the second one in South Wales, based in Pencoid, and benefited considerably from equity investment from um, Finance Wales, as it was called in those days. So I come at this from both an entrepreneur's point of view and an investor's point of view. Oops, sorry, what have I gone and done? So Development Bank of Wales was created in 2017. Uh, it was a natural progression uh, out of uh, Finance Wales. It is broadly uh, set up uh, in two uh, sides. So there's the equity side of the organization and the debt side of the organization. Uh, a large part of the equity side um, is the team that all four of us that I talked to today work in, and that's called the Technology Ventures Investing Team. Development Bank of Wales was created to help fund businesses and stimulate the economy in Wales. Uh, so funding businesses all the way through from early stage equity right the way through to senior debt and all of the uh, various incarnations in between. Um, sorry, a, a few technical problems uh, just for a moment. Um, before you get involved in equity investing, it's really important for you to understand uh, the risk appetite of the investor that you're going to be working with. And that appetite depends very much on the stage of the investment that you're in. <clears throat> so the investor will often talk in terms of a risk to return ratio or a risk to reward ratio. And this will normally be kept constant through the different phases of investing that your business will go through. Begs the question then, what is meant by return? Uh, on a debt uh, investment, return is a very simple thing to, to comprehend, and it manifests itself as the um, interest rate that you would expect to pay on a capital sum that you borrow. On an equity um, investment, the return is slightly uh, more complex because the equity investor can't expect to see any monetary gain from their investment until the business exits, and that could be five, seven, or 10 years down the line. <clears throat> so equity investors uh, tend to, if you can move on to the next slide, please, Colin. Equity investors tend to talk in terms of a return on their investment or a return multiple, which is shown at the top of this matrix, uh, as well as uh, look at the number of years for which they've been invested. And when you bring those two things together, you come up with what's known as the internal rate of return, which you can think of in, in the same way that you do um, a an interest rate on debt. An early stage equity investor is going to want to have a return that's in the amber band in the middle there or the green band, and a debt investor would normally be in the white space in that zone. If you look at those and you think of them in terms of a uh, 
um, an interest rate, they do seem extremely high, but that's because the risk, risk involved in investing in an early stage venture is also very high. <clears throat> and uh, lots of ventures, uh, very early stage ventures, uh, don't make it um, right the way through to exit. Next slide, please, Cole. So if you look at the different stages of investing and the risk and the return that an investor can expect, at the seed end of things, very high risk, uh, rate of return is of the order uh, greater than 30%. And the funding you'd be looking for there is uh, specialist equity investors who like that space together with grant funding. The beauty of grant funding is that there is no return expected on that. It's an investment usually from central government to help stimulate uh, your business and help stimulate um, technology. As your company matures and matriculates out of seed into super seed, the risk comes down, it's still high, so the return is still relatively high, uh, and the funding now territory is very much equity space. Grant funding would have run out by now. Again, matriculate into series A, the risk is down to medium, the return has come down to between 20 and 30%. You're moving away from equity, beginning to drift into debt or a blend, which uh, is an instrument called a mezzanine investment. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, uh, at, the, at the end of the journey, uh, Series B and onwards, uh, the risk is low, the return is relatively low, so below 20%, and now you're into mezzanine and debt, which is a good position for you as, new, uh, as a, an entrepreneur to be because you don't want to be giving away much more equity in your company. Next slide, please, Cole. What do we look for in a seed business or an early stage business? The first and most important thing for us is going to be the management team. And this will be common across all of the different type of investors that you engage with. For us at very early stage, the management team needs to be able to convince us that they're able to take the business on to the next level or the next level again. So as a technology fund, we would expect them to be technically competent in their space, we would like them to have experience, although we recognize that's often not the case. And we would like them like to be convinced that they're able to execute on their business model, build their company uh, and move it to the next stage. That brings up uh, an important and often emotive point. You may be the uh, founder of the business and the CEO of the business at inception, but as you move through the different stages of investment, you may not be the right person to take the company forward. So, you need to get yourself prepared to, at some point, step away from being the CEO of the company and let somebody else come in to, to manage the company through to exit. The next most important thing, being a technology-led uh, fund, is the product and the uh, level of readiness of that product. There's an internationally uh, known scale out there called technology readiness levels. It's worth looking that up on inter internet and finding out what it means. It's a scale that runs from one to nine, designed by NASA to make sure that uh, all products that went into their, their craft uh, all meet the common standard. We would typically look to invest at technology readiness level three or four. And through the life of uh, the time that you spend in seed, we would expect to see considerable advances in that so that when you leave the seed stage, you'd be at technology readiness seven or eight. We look at technology through two different lenses. One of those is to look at a company which is technology generative. So you're creating something genuinely new. Uh, that creates a good barrier to entry from competition, and that's usually in the form of patents. So we, we like companies to have created one or two patents, have a family of patents and have more in the pipeline. Alternatively, your business might be technology enabled. Software companies tend to fall into this space. If you're technology enabled, it's more difficult to have a barrier to entry. So we look for other uh, barriers to entry, which might be you're operating in a particularly niche space, um, you have um, expertise and know-how that's difficult to come by, something that gives you at least a year or so advantage over your competition. That gives us an opportunity to get product into the marketplace. <coughs> Excuse me. The next is the value proposition. Value proposition is, um, is there a real pain in the industry that one or more of your potential customers is feeling? And if you solve that pain, they would be willing to buy it from you. So we are looking for value propositions that uh, address a um, market pull rather than a market push. It's pointless developing something that ultimately somebody out there doesn't really want. 
business model and finances are key to us. This is absolutely the key go-to document for us. So um, the business model needs to be clear and articulate and easy to understand. It doesn't need to be war and peace. 20, 30 pages is usually plenty. But at the seed end of things, because lots of things are outside of your control, you need to make sure that the business plan is very resilient and has lots of different avenues to achieve the same end goal. It's highly unlikely at the seed end of things that you're gonna go from point A to point B in a straight line. It's likely to be lots of cul-de-sacs, lots of different avenues that you go up that end up being blind alleys. So you need to make sure your business plan takes that into account. Following on from the business plan, you'll have your financial model. And the finance model likewise has to be resilient and has to reflect the flexibility that's in your business plan. We will stress test the finance model and work with you on that to make sure that it'll cope with the different scenarios that you may encounter along your journey. And typical ones that we find are for a early stage pre-revenue company, too much reliance on getting uh, revenue in in the first year or two. Um, what makes you think that having never sold anything before, suddenly you're able to sell things. So you need to be careful of that. And another one is, are you raising enough money in the first place? Um, understandably, as an entrepreneur, you come forward, you look for raising the minimum amount of money because you don't want to give too much equity away. But in raising the minimum amount of money, are you providing yourself with enough runway to look at, to be able to sort out contingencies, to be able to execute on your business plan? So we work quite hard with you on that. Interestingly, finances take on a different meaning as you go through the different stages of investing in your company, as your company goes on that journey. And for later stage companies, um, an investor will look more at the historic finances than the forward going finances because they want to know, having created a business plan in the past, did you execute on it? How well did you execute? How much did you spend compared to what you said you were going to spend? And are you beginning to approach the point where you can service debt rather than equity? <clears throat> the market clearly is key to us. Um, we expect you to be operating in a market that's fairly substantial and growing at, at, at a good rate. It's pointless going into a market that's shrinking um, because ultimately you're just not going to give us the return. We expect you to corner single digit percentages or so of that market space. So we expect the market to be of the order of 100 million pounds or so in value and growing at sort of five to 10% uh, annually. Finally, but by no means least is scalability. The proposition that you put forward to us has to be scalable. It's pointless us investing in something if it, if it can't uh, grow, grow into the marketplace. A great example here is the conflict between a technology-driven consultancy and a software-as-a-service kind of business or a SaaS business. The consultancy may be cash generative, it may be doing well, but ultimately it's not scalable because you are restricted by the number of clients and customers that you personally can interact with. Uh, and the value of the, uh, the contracts will be um, roughly provide us with a one times return. So that, that's just not a, a, not a very attractive proposition for us. But if you're perhaps using some bespoke software in the background in order to deliver your consultancy, and you are in a position to turn that software into a product and license that product to your customers, maybe with some support up front, that becomes a software as a service opportunity. That now is very attractive because you can access far more customers because it's now online. Uh, which is almost an infinite source of customers that you can reach out to. Uh, and um, it, it's an almost guaranteed uh, source of revenue going forward because your clients are likely to renew their licenses on an annual basis. That gives us a much better return on investment. My colleague Alex, uh, who's speaking um, in the next session, is our sort of internal expert in software as a service. So if any questions in that regard, please uh, don't be afraid to reach out to him. Next slide, please, Carl. Technology Seed Fund uh, specifically, we did at one point think of calling this the um, Wales Technology Fund, but we decided the three letter acronym for that probably wasn't appropriate, so back down and called it the Technology Seed Fund. Uh, tech Seed Fund, a couple of the important criteria are 
it has to be Welsh based. That probably goes without saying, but you'd be amazed how many people approach us and ask, as long as we have some sort of presence in Wales, Wales can we still invest? Welsh presence means it has to be registered in Wales at company's house. You have to have a physical presence in Wales, uh, a lease on a premises, and you have to have some of your executive team based there. So the economic benefit is felt in Wales. By no means all activity has to go on there, recognizing that some companies, for instance, my last company, um, the laboratory that we had to use was in Sheffield. There was no other laboratory in the UK that we could use. So a considerable amount of technical development went, went on um, up there. Co-investors, all of the funds that we deploy across the whole of Development Bank of Wales are co-investment funds. We need to have a certain level of investment to sit alongside us. Next slide, please, Cole. And the type of co-investor depends very much on the stage of investment that you're at. So this simple graph here just shows seed, super seed, series A and beyond, and tells you on there roughly what type of investors you can expect uh, to be attracted to each of those phases. So in the seed stage, the this, this space that I operate in, clearly Development Bank is there. You'd also expect to have a level of funding from friends and family, uh, a level of funding from angels uh, who would be benefiting from tax relief. So they would be looking to invest under the SEIS and EIS schemes. And of course, there's grant funding. Now, we can't match against the grant funding, but if you bring those investors together to form a grouping or a consortium, then that money can be used to match against the grant. Seed end of things, broadly speaking, goes up to a maximum of about 500,000. Once you pass that, you're kind of getting into the super seed territory. Now the flavor of your investors changes. Clearly, Development Bank of Wales will still be there. It's likely that friends and family would have fallen away because the amount of money now is beginning to get outside what they can achieve. Uh, angels, uh, SEIS and EIS will still be around. Uh, grant funding is probably no longer appropriate because your technology readiness level should have improved to the point where um, grant funding isn't available. Uh, and you could well be uh, starting to look at getting some funding from uh, larger organizations like the crowd. So that's uh, the organizations such as Cedars or CrowdQ. Again, um, up once you pass a certain sort of um, threshold of roughly 2 million or so you're into uh, Series A funding. By this time, the um, individual angels have fallen away, so the SEIS, but you'd be into uh, EIS funds, so collective funds that can come together to put larger sums of money in, uh, VCTs for venture capital, as well as Development Bank of Wales. And finally, after that, you'd be looking for much larger sums of money. So in the, in the later stages, you could look for private equity, city money, or potentially a uh, early stage um, private uh, public offering. Uh, my colleague Mike will be addressing this, these late, later stages and just explaining uh, what that looks like. On to the next one, please, Cole. Uh, valuation and exit. This is an emotive issue for both investors and a practical issue from our point of view. If you think of it from the developer, from um, our point of view, development bank of, of view point of view, when we enter, make an entry level investment into a company, it's important for us to have sufficient shareholding in the company so that at exit, we can achieve our three, four, five times return. We can achieve the internal rate of return that I, I showed you earlier. That means if your valuation when you come to us is too high, we won't be able to get the roughly 15% or so ownership in the company that we need in order to make it attractive to us as investors. We have a limited pot of the order of 250,000 to put in at the seed end of things. That means that the valuation of your company is going to have to be of the order of one, one and a half million or so. To get a starting point for valuation of a company, we look at those six pillars I mentioned earlier that underpin a company, put a nominal value of about 250,000 maximum on each of those pillars and grade your company roughly just to get a feel for what we think the, the opening uh, discussion should be around, around valuation. And typically it comes out to around one to 1.2 million. If you come to us and say, my company is brilliant, I haven't sold anything, I haven't finished developing the product, but it's got to be worth 10 million. 
we, we can't even begin to look at that. So it's important that valuation is right for us. And we do turn lots of deals down because we can't agree on valuation. Thanks very much. That concludes the, the bulk of my presentation. If you can go on to the next slide, please, Cole. These are just questions I want, want you to consider when you're thinking about early stage uh, investing uh, in your, your business. You might want to consider these whilst having your hair cut, which six months ago seemed like a chore, now seems like a luxury, or even sitting in a beer garden, you never know. <clears throat> so where does your business sit within, within the six pillars? How would you grade yourself? What type of investment should you be looking for? So are you going to approach friends and family, EIS, SEIS? Do you know any uh, SEIS investors? What is a realistic valuation for your business? And so what sort of return can you provide to your investors? So sit down and have a real hard think about not just what you feel it's worth, but what you think is attractive to the investors. And finally, is your business plan and your finance model fit the purpose? Is it robust enough? Is it flexible enough? Is there enough resilience built into the model? Thanks very much. I will now hand you over to my colleague, Alex, who will talk to you about the next stage, the super seed end of funding. Great. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, fantastic presentation uh, and really helpful just understanding the various stages. So I like that initial graph. So uh, as Carl mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you about super seed funding, also known as late stage seed funding. And my background is also starting out as an engineer working in high tech startups before coming in, becoming an investor. So we like to think that we've got a very rounded approach as investors and we are business people and then investors and not the other way around. Okay, so let's dive in. And now this is a very interactive presentation. So um, I do want you to comment and uh, submit questions. And uh, to stimulate that, I want you to answer this question. What is, oh, we've just had a, we've given away the answer. Bear with us <laughs> one second. Um, <laughs> okay, we're just gonna go back anyway. So what we're looking at here is the value of death. Um, and um, the reason that it's called the value of death is because uh, it's, it's a very difficult period um, during the fundraising process of any business. So just um, in terms of, uh, I'll explain that now, in terms of content and timing, we're going to go into defining what is this, this piece of the journey, um, how you actually go through it, and how you get out of it importantly. We've got about 10 minutes remaining in the presentation. So without further ado, let's kick off. Sorry, just bear with us. We've just got some technical issues. Okay, so, and thank, I see a couple of comments in, in the chat there, so thank you for those. Um, okay, so what is this valley of death? Well, essentially it's, the, the gap between where you have commer uh, commercial funding and um, institutional funding from the likes of government. So what do we mean by that? At the early phases, there's lots of funding available to your team. You've got uh, lots of R&D tax credits, you've got uh, you know, universities providing funding and so forth. But as you move along the level of development, that funding right runs out and the commercial sector isn't quite ready to take on the level of risk in startups. And that means you're in this precarious situation. And uh, thanks Becky for your question earlier. What do you need in terms of what is the private sector looking for? In terms of a series A, they're usually looking for a million pounds of annual recurring revenue. That means 80,000 pounds per month. So that's quite a big ask. Also, you're gonna need a fully formed board and team and a technically robust product. Investors will not only be looking for strong commercial activity, but making sure that you've got all your systems and procedures in place and that you have the relevant um, security protocols implemented. So you need to be well-rounded by the time you approach those private uh, investors. And this is one of the reasons why DBW has been set up to address this 
market failure uh, in the funding life cycle. We come in at those early stages, right at the beginning of that value of death. Uh, and that's also what Carl mentioned at the seed end and super seed, they're both kind of you know, very much in, in the same realm. And we will support you from seed, super seed, and right the way through. So we can invest from 100K uh, up to 2 million on any round and up to 5 million in any one investment. Okay, now let's move on. So let's talk a bit about the journey, how you actually get through that uh, valley of death. Now, just bear with us for the next picture. And again, this is a time for, for you to please interact with us. So please do um, comment on the next slide. Great, so who is this? And uh, as I say, I'm looking at the Q&A section, and I think you all know it's our, exactly, it's our furry blue friend, Sonic the Hedgehog. And why is this relevant to you? Uh, next slide, please. Oh. Because he moves quickly, and that's exactly what you need to do through this valley of death. Now, three main points here. Number one, that failure is good. And why do we say that? Because if you're failing, it means that you're trying hard and you're failing fast and you're carrying on. And it's something that startups really need to embrace. And particularly on marketing, we had a very good session yesterday in our CXO forum, just educating our portfolio companies on how to get to market, how to tell their story. And you want to be testing those, those things while you still have cash in the bank, because when it comes to later and the cash is running dry, you'll be too scared to actually try new things. And there's a very infamous quote uh, by, by the, the CEO of a company saying, I know I'm wasting half of my marketing budget, but I just don't know which half. So you really need to find that out as quickly as possible. Now, second up, customers. You've already got your funding in the bank, so forget about your investors, focus on your customers, try and address their needs. And, and that way you'll get perfect product market fit and find out what your true value proposition is. And that's certainly the route to, to really getting to scale is engaging with those early stage customers. And number three, very importantly, focus. Uh, at the early stages of a startup, everything might seem like a good idea. And in reality, there are often unhelpful distractions and will detract from your core mission. And this is where a really good board comes in and helps keep you focused. And uh, we've said before, but up to 70% of the time in the boardroom should be spent on discussing strategy and defining your mission, value, and purpose, because this is a kind of a decision framework that will help you make decisions and execute quickly. And as I say, depart from that value. Next slide, please, Cole. Okay, so we've spoken a bit about departure. Next slide. Where do you want to go? And it is certainly that departure lounge. Being in that valley of death is not comfy at all. Uh, you are pretty reliant on external funding. Hopefully not. Hopefully you can get your money from your customers, but you're going to be slightly uncomfortable. So you want to move through that as quickly as reasonably possible to get to that series A so that funding doesn't just become a necessity. It's more, okay, we've got something good here. We could grow um, at, you know, at our current levels, but we just want to supercharge our, our growth and make the ship go faster. So how do you, how do you get out of this valley? Next slide, thanks, Cole. Number one, good advice is key. Um, and that, that's what DBW really, really strives to do. And, and that was evidence yesterday with our portfolio CXO forum. And just amongst the, the three of us speaking today, Carl, uh, myself, and Mike shortly, we've done about at least 150 transactions and have 30 years of investing experience. And in our little seed fund, our 20 million seed fund, we have at least 30 companies. So we've seen a lot of things before and we can help guide you on the journey and help you avoid obvious mistakes. Number two is 
be like spring steel. And uh, I, I think this is a really good quality in life, let alone just in startups. And what do I mean by that is you need to be able to take on advice. And this is a good defining characteristic of resilient C CEOs and, and business leaders. So you take on the advice, you bend and flex, you're malleable. Uh, but also one of the characteristics of spring steel is that you're able to spring back into life, ward off any bad advice, any uh, you know, attacks by competitors, and keep going forward. So uh, please keep that in mind at all times, especially when you've got a supportive institutional funder like DBW on your side. We are there to help you. We really want you to succeed. So um, we'd love to work with you on that. Now, number three, and again, we will help you with this as well. Shake the tree. Um, go to existing investors and say, okay, look, we're going up for our, our Series A. What do we need to do? And, you know, Bear in mind that you're going to have a lot of due diligence at Series A. You're going to have management due diligence, legal, commercial, technical, financial. So you, you don't want to give them any reasons to delay the transaction, pull out of it. And most importantly, if they do find things that you haven't found yourself or disclosed, it's going to chip away to valuation. So it's in everyone's interest to make sure that you go up with a very robust transparent offering, and as I say, work with your current investors to find out what those gaps might be. Next slide, please, Carl. So in summary, what, what have we discussed today? Number one, most importantly, DBW is here for you. We come in during that very critical valley of death. Um, so if you do have an innovative tech venture and you're looking for funding, uh, and even if you're not in Wales, you know, there, there, there are ways to come across the bridge and satisfy the requirements. Uh, please get in touch. Uh, we, our doors always open. Number two, whether we're on board or not, just remember to focus. Uh, try to do one thing and do it very well. You can always diversify later. And number three, advice is golden. Remember, this is probably the first or second time you've been on this journey whereas other people specialize in it, they do it for a living. So taking on advice is always gonna be worth it in the medium and long term, even if it's not immediately obvious. Next slide, please, Cole. Okay, so what did we look at today? We looked at the value of death, we defined it, we helped you on your journey, and we showed you how you might be able to get out. So finally, I'll leave you with some questions to consider. Next slide, please, Paul. Is your cash burn low enough to make it out of the valley of death? And just bear in mind that things always cost at least twice as much and take twice as long. Number two, do you have both a business strategy and a fundraising strategy? And remember, in that valley of death, you're probably in negative cash burn territory. So they are equally important. Don't just look to the current raise, say, what does raise two and three look like? Who, who's available? Who's in the market? How big is it going to be? Is my valuation appropriate for this stage to provide an uplift for my investors going forward? And number three, are you mentally ready for the journey? It's not easy being an entrepreneur. And um, we always advise you to have a co-founder, to take on, you know, deal with those stresses and strains and have the right support structures around you to make sure that you succeed. And lastly, next slide, please, Cole. I'll leave you with this famous quote. Though I walk through the valley of a shadow of death, really, in light of the recent situation, it's just nice to get outside. So really enjoy the journey, everyone, and good luck. I'm now going to hand you over to my colleague, Mike Bakewell, to talk about scaling capital who will take you from Series A right through to IPO. Mike's got an incredible amount of experience actually being on this journey himself. Um, so we're very lucky to have him. And I'm personally looking forward to the talk. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Alex. That was uh, thoroughly interesting. So I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about scaling capital and later stage funding and exit. <clears throat> As Alex um, uh, alluded to, Series A looking for uh, an annual recurring income of around about a, a million pounds a year. 
And typical Series A fundraisings are around two to 10 million. Series B with a 5 million annual recurring revenue is about 10 to 20 million. And Series C, and indeed D, E, F, um, you've probably heard anywhere from 20 million upwards. Um, you may have heard of Deliveroo's 575 million fundraise last summer. This slide, I talk about some of the, the, the features of a business at late stage and uh, what investors might be looking for. Um, by this time, you'll have an established management team, which is likely to be very different from the one that you started out with. Um, you'll have typically a chair in place and maybe one or more non-exec um, directors alongside you. Um, and there will be considerable changes internally uh, within your business. Product market fit. Alex touched very clearly on this. Um, by, by this point at Series A and beyond, you will fully understand how your product fits into the market. You'll understand such things as customer churn rates and how to retain them. And you'll continue to be solving a, a problem, a real pain in the market. Um, at this stage, you'll be seeing some competitive pressure, I'm sure. ARR and YOY growth and cost of customer acquisition are key areas for um, investors looking to um, provide cash at Series A and onwards. Um, evidencing momentum of growth is key and seeing if you're scaling, scaling regularly. And cost of customer acquisition, um, a key metric, uh, particularly with those businesses um, as software and service sector particularly, you know, how much are you spending to acquire uh, one pound of incremental revenue? It's a key metric. Alongside other KPIs, which you, you will have developed, you'll become quite an expert in that area. A market visibility and recognition. As your company grows, you'll be increasingly recognized, not just by your potential customers, but by your competitors too. Your competitors will always be trying to eat your lunch. And investors, investors will always be on the lookout for ex exciting, fast-growing businesses. Next slide, please, Kev. This slide talks about working towards an exit. All investors are looking for a liquidity event or an exit, which they can make a, a return on the investment that they've made. Top of that list is corporate governance. We at DBW start laying the foundations when we make our investments, ensuring board meetings are held, the right documents provided, etc. <clears throat> but as this grows, the, the pressure upon management teams to balance the, the uh, interests of all its stakeholders, its investors, needs to be taken into account. Clear roles of the, the directors, clear roles of the non-execs, and the establishment of remuneration committees, etc. A very key point. A quick Google will show you the, the perils of poor corporate governance. There's been a number of high-level failures in this. In this in this area. And exit aspirations. Teams and investors will now be looking at exits. The choices of exits tend to grow as the business grows. You know, have you grown enough? Have you achieved the strategy that you, you planned when you set out? Are you being approached by perhaps acquirers or, or um, private equity houses? And what are your existing investors saying? and additional management. As the company grows, you may have come across the, the phrase crisis of management or crisis of control, layers of uh, middle management, etc. Founders will no longer be able to directly manage all the organization. It presents an issue and how you manage that governs significantly your success going forward and strategy, a huge area. I'm not going to turn this into a, a business school debate, but you know, strategic, do you, can you see far enough into the future? Can you see where your market's going? Can you see what's happening with technology? Do you have the data to back up your judgments? How do you get there? And what do you need investment for? Before going out to raise funding, strategy really needs to be nailed on. I'll talk a little bit about investors and, and sources of finance. Private equity, of course, private equity, um, venture capital. Venture capital tends to invest pre-revenue, private equity post-revenue. 
there are a number of specialist investors and as I mentioned in a slide previously they will be tracking you um, particularly those private equity houses which specialize in a certain area be that life science um, biotech what, whatever um, they will have companies in their portfolio and they will have spotted you as a competitor to that portfolio company don't be surprised if you um, have unsolicited calls where they're trying to um, you know try and understand what you're trying to do it's flattering but also also be careful um, and lumped into private equity we've also got um, hedge funds and other esoteric city capital which could be available to you I put banks in there which um, whilst not necessarily equity investors in the main provide a good source of capital particularly for growing companies which have a positive uh, cash flow. Debt funding, if not over leveraging the business, can provide uh, significant support between fundraising rounds. It's typically cheaper than um, equity funding and perhaps some of the more specialist banks, merchant banks, may be able to broker a uh, corporate bond issue on your behalf. Again, I would make the point that um, over leveraging businesses through significant debt um, has been a problem both in UK business and in global businesses so something to be keenly aware of. Corporate venturing, um, co now corporate venturing is where a corporate may take an equity stake in, in your business particularly in some sectors um, for example life science, Nestle Ventures and in technology perhaps Google Ventures are always keen to um, uh, seek out and invest into those businesses which uh, they feel have a, a synergy with what they're doing in their business. They're, they come with deep knowledge. Um, corporate venturing is a, is a fantastic way for growing businesses to attain significant uh, technical and marketing advantages over their, their competitors. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the perils though of, of accepting corporate investment is that it may limit your invest, your excess opportunities. Some corporates will prevent you from exiting to one of their competitors for quite understandable reasons. And the final tile on, on this slide is, is organic growth. If the company is, is growing and rather like uh, arranging debt from banks, if you can fund your growth organically through, through cash flow, tends to preserve the, the value of the existing shareholders position. Um, however, the data shows us that those companies which have grown purely with organic growth, although there are always some exceptions, tend to grow somewhat slower than those which have been significantly funded through external capital. And next slide, please. And exit routes, exit opportunities. Typically, when we look at uh, investments uh, first time round, trade buyers uh, feature highly, and quite rightly too. The majority of exits uh, they don't occur through the, the offices of a, uh, an insolvency practitioner. tend to be tend to be through trade buyers. You can attain superior value, particularly with those trade buyers which see a clear synergy with what they're undertaking, the sum typically being greater than the parts, some of the whole being greater than the parts. Management buyouts, buy-ins, another popular route, particularly in the UK, um, it's a, um, a, a common human uh, approach to try and keep things within the family. If you've worked with uh, a management team over a number of years, certainly in successful businesses, then there is often an obligation of the uh, major shareholders, funder, uh, founders, to try and keep it in inverted commas within the family. Management buyouts funded by private equity houses or venture capital firms are, um, are particularly common and they're very successful typically. The management stay on, they know the business, they know the market um, and certainly provides a, a positive route to access. I put fund buyouts um, on, on the slide. Typically this used to be very rare for, for unlisted companies. It was a methodology used by private equity houses to take public companies private where the private equity fund could see superior value 
potentially being obtained with the company being private rather than rather than publicly listed. Um, but now we're seeing more of that happening at all stages of development, even free revenue, where a private equity house will take a majority stake. Uh, the management typically will, will exit in, in some degree, but remain, and the company grows and develops until buyer is located. And finally, public markets, the much wanted IPO. Um, IPOs, a successful IPO, confers much kudos on those that um, have successfully done it. But uh, beware, it takes a long time, it's quite expensive, and the um, regulatory and administrative burdens are, are significant. However, it opens a, uh, an enormous field of additional capital to enable you to fund your strategy. And a couple of a few considerations here, um, both relating to time. Timescales, things take longer than you expect, both in, in company growth and in raising funds. Um, DBW are a, a patient investor. We are happy to stay with our investments over a significant period of time. We're not limited by the usual limited partner general partner structure of the majority of private equity and venture capital houses, which means we do, we do not have to exit um, at um, inopportune times or when value hasn't been properly created. Um, for example, in a, in a previous fund, I backed a, uh, a company at Series A in 2006. The company finally exited to the AIM market, floated on the AIM market in 2016. So that's a period of 10 years between Series A and IPO, and the company was growing massively quickly in that interim period. So the note there, things don't tend to happen quickly. And the right time, raising capital at the right time to maximize value, and indeed raise capital at all. Um, we've all encountered the, the COVID ec epidemic currently, um, there are uncertainties around Brexit, um, which can suppress valuations and availability of capital. However, raising, raising capital when you have um, opened up a new market, uh, there's been a particular surge in the product that you're offering, or you've developed a new uh, technology internally, are great stories. Messages here, whenever you go out to the market, always have a great supportable story to tell. You may have read recently in the press that um, the AIM market, which has been closed for most of um, 2020, closed in that, uh, I, I mean, there haven't been many quotations, um, has recently um, reopened. There are now a queue of new companies seeking to, to launch on AIM. And as, as one corporate finance advisor put on Twitter um, on Monday evening, uh, he's he thinks that he could float his granny at this market. And a final, final point, if you've already raised capital in Series A or seed or pre-seed, then you're already successful. You convince professional investors that you, your business, your product or service and opportunity is worthy of, of backing. My message is keep going. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, um, Alex, Carl and Mike. What a fantastic job whisking us through um, the from seed to exit in uh, 45 minutes. As you'll see here on this graph, this is what we've been through this morning. Uh, we took 45 minutes to do that, uh, when in reality, that's more likely to take four to five years, uh, as we heard from Mike, if not double that. Um, so what a great job they've done. Thank you. Uh, and actually, you know, putting up with the, the technical problems that happened um, during that talk, so we must apologize for those. And I think if anyone's got uh, a solution for that, that's uh, less temperamental, then not only would you have a potential customer in Dev Bank, but you never know, maybe an investor as well. Um, okay, so you've heard, uh, you heard it from my colleagues this morning. Um, I'm just gonna put this slide up here, which is a, a summary of the key points that they talked about. 
Um, I'm going to leave that up here for, for 10 minutes or so um, because we're going to go to a quick break now so everyone, uh, everyone can go grab a cup of tea. Um, we are going to come back at 11.40. Um, so please come back on time because we've got an excellent panel up next um, where you're going to hear from Talent Intuition, Practical CFO, Simply Do Ideas and Creo Medical um, on their experiences of... Um, of raising investment and importantly I think that kind of founders perspective as well so you've heard about the the kind of the cash the uh, injection from an investor's perspective but what is it actually like to to go on that journey as a founder okay so I'll, I'll leave these up here please continue to ask uh, questions um throughout the 10 minute break um but we're gonna jump off video and audio for a minute so it will go quiet until 11:40. Hi everyone. Um, okay, so we're coming back from that quick break now and hopefully you've all had a chance to grab a cup of tea uh, or glass of water and settle back down. Um, I'm going to introduce the next session now, um, which if the technology works, is our founders panel, um, which is a great chance to actually hear from some of those founders and uh, colleagues in the startups that we've invested in about their experience. Okay, so with no further ado, I will hand over to Alison Ettridge from Talent Intuition. If you're there, Alison. Here indeed, can you hear me? Fantastic, okay, brilliant, over to you. Super, hi everyone, and thanks very much. Um, it was really interesting listening to the session this morning, and I thought it would be fantastic for us to be able to say, um, uh, let's hear from founders and from entrepreneurs about their journey. Um, I'm assuming that the rest of the founders are going to put their video on, Cole, so if we can, sorry, the rest of the panelists are going to put their video on, so if we could ask them to do that, that would be fantastic. They should. Okay. All, everyone is there, so uh, just give us a few minutes for everyone to filter through, and uh, they'll put their videos on. Super, no problems at all. While that's um, while they're bringing their videos on, perhaps it'd be helpful for me to make the introductions to the people as, as they're coming through. So we will be joined on the panel today by Andrew Tewitt of Business Wales, uh, and Andrew moved to Wales from Ireland. Um, he has entrepreneurship in his blood. Um, he set up a record label and a studio for putting young people and talent at the centre uh, of, of moving forward. Um, uh, he then uh, set up an ed tech consultancy. Andrew, perhaps you could stick your hand up when your video comes up so people can see what you look like. Um, he set up an ed tech consultancy and then in 2016 uh, did an MBA in Cardiff um, and after that Andrew then joined Business Wales. So welcome Andrew to the panel. Uh, let me also then introduce Angela Marie Graham. So Angela if you could thank you very much. Um, I hear nothing but great stuff about Angela Marie whenever um, anyone anyone talks about her and Angela Marie um, works for a business called Practical CFO Limited. Uh, and is a commercial CFO who fundamentally helps high growth startups to focus on maximising their profit um, uh, or reducing their loss, but hopefully maximising their profit. Um, her most recent experience actually was at a business called HFL, um, which was an owner managed business um, with a 20 million turnaround where Angela Marie was um, responsible for increasing profits by 500,000 a year. So you can see why we hear nothing but good stuff from uh, about Angela Marie. Uh, we're also joined by Lee Sharma. Lee, perhaps you could raise your hand. Uh, and Lee, you're on mute, just so that you're aware you're on mute. Um, Lee is C CEO of Simply Do Ideas, who are a portfolio business of the Development Bank of Wales. And Simply Do Ideas is a digital platform that helps businesses actually capture and deliver on their innovation. Um, uh, he's an expert in innovation and organisational change and Lee has driven the business really from um, an idea around a kitchen table to a digital product. Um, he successfully navigated two investment rounds um, and, and potentially some growth investment on the horizon um, and is building out an award-winning product and delivering commercial traction. So um, Lee, it would be really, really interesting to hear your, your, from you today. Uh, and, and last but by no means least, let me also introduce you to Richard. 
Richard there, Fab, thank you. Um, and Richard is CFO for Creo Medical. So um, again, a great success story. Uh, Richard joined Creo in July 2016, I think. Um, and prior to that, uh, was CFO with a business called SPTS Technologies, who are a manufacturer of semiconductor equipment. Uh, and in 2011, Richard was part of the management team um, that together with Bridgepoint um, helped that that business uh, be acquired for 200 million. Um, so yeah, there's, he, he's got some really good traction in, in big organizations. Um, Creo Medical, clearly um, another DBW invested business originally and were first invested when they were six or seven people, I think, in, an, oh in Baha, there you go. Uh, they moved to Chepstow, everyone stayed, which was fantastic. I think there's now about 70 people. Uh, closer to 100 now, I think, today. <sighs> okay, my facts are wrong. Thanks for pointing that out already, Richard. Um, <laughs> but, probably yeah. We probably added 10 yesterday, so that's okay. <laughs> Super, but there you go. So a great successful growth story. Um, the team was expanded uh, and listed on LSE, London Stock Exchange, in 2016. So a fantastic story of, um, here we have some practical hands-on advice from Andrew and Marie for some pre-seed and seed. Um, again, practical advice from Lee on that growth journey as we move into seed, super seed, and then growth and on to series A. Um, and then again, hands-on advice from uh, Richard as, as we kind of move into that series A, B, C, D, and then potentially on onto the offering. So during the panel today, I thought it'd be really interesting if, if we explored um, some areas and I think we'll, we'll start at the beginning of the journey so what happens kind of precede and then move through the journey and I think it's important that we keep through all of this the personal feeling what did it actually feel like as the founder or what have you seen from founders um, uh, and management teams as you're going through it so let's start with the kind of precede and Lee um, let me point the first question at you. Why go for funding in the first place? What was the decision-making process? I think that's a that's a great place to start, actually. I mean, from I think you, you see a lot of TV programs and you see a lot of stuff in the press of Silicon Valley, and it almost feels like a rite of passage that if you've got a, you know a tech product, you can go and raise investment. Um, I think for us, it was very much around deciding. It was actually I say us. It was the Royalists. It was me at the start, um, around that kitchen table. I think it's just around deciding about can you get to where you want to be with the resources that you've got and I think the resources are obviously around capability and, and, and capacity so I think be, and then sort of I suppose the next thing is, is being comfortable with um, losing a bit of control and I think that's never easy as a kind of a you know as a founder you kind of you're naturally I think by disposition you're a, you're a bit of a control freak um, but actually that's a good thing because you become accountable and you become responsible and I'm sure we'll touch on that later on. But I think the, the key is, can you can you deliver your vision with the resources you've got? If not, then investment becomes something you should be looking at. Yeah, really interesting. And Andrew, you're on mute, but if you could come off mute, I know that you're working um, particularly right now with a couple of tech businesses that are, are bootstrapping their way through. Um, and I suspect as a result, you're kind of having that conversation that says, should we go for funding? Um, what, what's your view, kind of why, why should an organisation that's kind of pre seeds think about this? Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the like um, Lee hit the nail on the head there really with, uh, with that, it's about the bootstrapping, being able to get your business as far down the line as possible to get some sort of MVP out there, maybe by a product, to get a bit of traction, to get some feedback you know, to get some data in a couple of iterations of your product. And, you know, I know, I know the guys um, when they did the presentation earlier on touched on having an MVP and having traction it makes it an awful lot easier. If you go looking for funding straight away, you're asking for someone to invest in your idea. Whereas if you're going to go and test it first, you can see the, the sweat, the equity, the, the sweat that you've put in, what the lessons you've learned, where you've come on your journey. Um, you, you just learn so much more and it's a lot easier to put a bit of valuation on your business when you have something coming in. Um, and I think you get a bit more leverage as well on that perspective. A really good example would be, I had a, a, a business come to me about two years ago. Um, <clears throat> guy had a great idea for an app um, sitting in the mental health space and he just 
he had this idea and that's all he had he had no software development capabilities so we sat down we mapped everything out i convinced him to try and go away and find a team someone who's got experience in public health and mental health and well-being and someone who could do software development and they've done that they put that team together and then they were like right we've got the team we want to raise some money i said well try and build something now you can get so far, far down the line and you can get a lot of stuff built because you've got that team and your burn rate is going to be very very low they did that and they got a big contract with an organization and it absolutely bombed. Um, but the amount of stuff they learned, so literally 18 months later now, they've got an awful lot of traction with what they're doing. Their business looks nothing like what they thought it was gonna look like at the beginning. And now they've got people going to them asking, can they invest in their business? So doing it that way around is, is fantastic. Really interesting. And did they just, I think it's quite interesting, did they go for grants in order to kind of help them through that first piece? Or did they, they just go, you know what, they, we'll scrabble stuff together? Yeah, they, they, they all worked. Uh, one of the one of the guys um, was kind of coming more towards retirement age. So he was able to take on more of the kind of the business okay. lead role. And the other two did it um, on the side as a bit of a side gig um, while they were doing it. And they're at the point now where they, and this is a good question about going for funding. They're at the point where they can't make much more progress because of their work life as well. Well. so yeah. that at that point it's good for them to go get funding which lets them step away from their daytime job to push it but the risks are an awful lot less now because they've got traction on the platform they've got some users and they've worked some pretty high, prof high profile organizations in the uk as well so it gives them a lot of confidence so i think there's something quite interesting in that when um if i think about when we we went out for funding um we hadn't really got anything other than an idea because we knew it was going to cost us half a million quid to build what we needed to do and it was kind of like well you know it's either we do it or we don't do it and and i think if, if i talk from a personal experience and lee i really want to draw this out from you and then i'll, I'll make sure we come to angie marie and richard from a personal experience i think it wasn't until we kind of made that leap that said we are committing to this, we are leaving our full-time jobs and this is what we're doing, that actually we really started to kind of get anywhere. Lee, were you kind of juggling, you know, work, mortgage and, and simply do ideas right at the very beginning? Yes, that, and that, that's a really great question. I think it's, um, it, I think sometimes there's this feeling of you have to kind of jump in with both feet. I'm perhaps a bit more risk averse, so I'm always thinking about, well, actually you need to kind of, kind of keep paying your bills and everything. And, and you're right, I think at the start, all you kind of have is a story. I think some of the speakers earlier was talking about, you know, having a really good narrative around your idea. Um, and again, I think one of my things I'm not really strong at is telling a very good story. I'm not really that sort of type. I'm a bit more introverted. So I tend to need to try and find data. I need to try and find reasons why things won't work. So my approach, particularly in the early days, was very much around getting out and speaking to customers. It's a bit of a cliche and you hear it sort of thrown around a lot. But actually getting out and speaking to people and finding out whether they would actually be willing to kind of use your product or service and actually would they be willing to pay for it and, and you know and if and if not you're just wasting your time so rather than spend time kind of in a dark room kind of coding and developing a product get out there and speak to them and find out if actually if you are crazy or not yeah. um, and i think again that's a bit of a curse of us as, as ceos we think you know we think we can change the world but actually you know everything changes as soon as you as you you know hit your touch point with customers so I think for us, what you know, we did, probably I say again, it's royal we as habit, isn't it? But it was me. And then I think of myself and, and, and an intern, we kind of went out and just started speaking to, to customers at academic conferences. And you know, we ran an event where we got some people around a table and we were just talking to them about it and what the potential use cases could be of the product. And things naturally evolve over time as you kind of have more customers. But I think at the early stage, it was very much around just kind of getting out and speaking to people and letting them shape your product or service rather than thinking you've got something that everyone will use. Quite right, Angela Marie. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think what we found with the people that we work with is sometimes we have to get them to get clarity around their ideas. What are you trying to do? What problem is it you're trying to solve? And very often people come and they have got a great idea, but is that really what the market needs? Is that really where the market they need to get to or what they need to build at this time? So I think Lee's um, hit on a really good point there speaking to people finding out what is the problem the market really needs to have solved before you dive in feet first and then it makes building what you need to build next and the steps you need to take a bit e um, a bit easier i think yeah and and without us planning this actually you've led really easily into the next question which is what should people be doing in order to plan for the raise what is the prep work that you should have ready and, and Angela Marie perhaps you could lead on this and then Richard um, I'll, if, if you could draw in as well because I think it changes over the course of time that'd be fantastic well yes we talked about the idea first of all um, understanding your market 
your potential market size. So doing a bit of research there. Um, and then I suppose there's two parts to it really, isn't it? What, what do you need to build and how do you need to sell it? So some idea around what you need to build, what it might look like, who needs to be involved to do that, who needs to help you, what support you need, and then how do you get it out there to the market? We've talked about the internet and it, it, it's great, but it's so big and you can, be, you can feel so small when you first step out. So how are you gonna do it as a small person? How are you gonna build a community? Are you gonna start offline and then move that onto the online? Are you gonna start online and move that the other way around? Are you, yeah, I mean, it seems very obvious sometimes, but when you look at your product, is it truly a product for consumers or is it business to business? What types of business, what sizes of business? So I think before you even um, go too far down the line, you might want to think out what my product is, what my market is, what it might look like. And then you start to get a step of, OK, now we can start looking at some numbers and what that might look like and KPIs, etc. But yeah, understand your market and your, your fit into it and how you reach it. Really interesting, Richard. Yeah, I think it's the quantum of the race is quite, well, it's, it's not quite important, it's, it's very important. I think if you're looking at, you know, something for six, nine, 12 months, it's understanding where do you go next? Um, and at what point are you gonna really face pressures on that cash flow? So if, if, if the cash flows are gonna hit in nine months time, there's no point raising money that gets you to nine months. You've gotta take that out to, to 18 months, or you've gotta have the gates in particular, knowing that someone like a Finance Wales is not going to just issue you with the next round or, or angels are not going to issue you with the next round, you know, within weeks. They're going to take months to get there. They've got to get all the legals in place, etc. They've got to do their diligence. So, you know, never think if it's a nine month project, always probably take it out to 12, 18 months. Have that bandwidth to give yourself the ability to overachieve as well. If you overachieve and overachieve quickly, you want that cash flow there that you can then start to, to warm people up to, well, look what we've done with the money, what about the next round? Yes. And, it, and, and you can push the valuation probably slightly higher by doing that as well. Really interesting. Angela Marie? Yeah, I think to do that though, you need to build a very strong model. And what we've often found with people is they've got the P&L and they bring that along and they've not interrogated it in any way because they've had this wonderful idea we're going to sell it it's going to be this amount we're going to get x amount of millions in three years time and we don't need to worry and then as soon as you ask, you start asking some questions about that well how are you going to get that three million where are you going to build it where's your where's your um is your selling have you looked at your selling as a science for example and you know the steps you're going to get through every time to lead to a sale and how much does it start with and how much does it end with i think it's okay to say yes, you know, know what well, your cash is going to be in nine months time. But I think before you even start that, before you even start the raising, you need to really understand your financials and what they look like, particularly with cash. A lot of people, when they're starting out, they assume we sell it and we get the cash immediately. And we know that life doesn't work like that. People don't think of the expenses that will come even before they get their first penny in on the bank, all those sort of things. So I agree, it is important once you've got your plan to understand your runway and understand your burn and how long your first raise got to last for. But I do think you need to take a bit of time even before that, just understanding the financials of what it is you'd like to do. Yeah, I was listening to Carl Griffiths earlier who, who was talking about different stages and actually he was saying that particularly at seed and pre-seed, you know, they want to see a business plan um, and they want to see you know, your financials and your forecast, but they want to be able to model you know, what happens if, if actually sales are down 25%, what happens if they're up 25%, what, what are the impacts? Um, and, and how that changes as, as the organisation grows and actually as we get much more towards latter stage, it's how have you performed against your historical plan? Yeah, you know, do you do what you say you're going to do rather than necessarily some of the modelling? Um, Lee, how how much help did you have when you were first kind of putting together the the plan and the models? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, th there's a lot of advice out there. I think there's there's something that I'm perhaps a little bit more um, skeptical of skeptical of the, than others, and um, I think you, you need to be careful about who you ask for advice. Um, and the first question I always think of is like, okay, so why should I listen to that person? So I was quite keen to wrap uh, wrap myself um, up with some really good people that had been there and done it. So yeah. we're quite lucky that we've got a very experienced chairman now um, who'd been through various investment rounds and he knew the process very well. Um, but actually, as part of our of our angel round, which was our second round, and it was you know with with their bank as well, um, we knew that we were getting in kind of you know we call them super six, kind of you know six people that were really experienced. Um, but equally, they understood that, you know, we were still at, at that stage, we were still, you know, fairly early. 
So, you know, they'd run businesses before, so they kind of knew that we need to have kind of, you know, everything in place, business plan, financial model and everything else. But equally, it was more around, you know, the story backed up by, you know, the financial model and the business plan. And f for me, it feels like, that, that you know, as we're now looking at a growth round, obviously the kind of the story becomes less important and it moves more towards, you know, the three things I always think about a, a trajectory. So the story. So what's your, you know, what you aim to do and um, traction and team. And it mm -hmm. feels that obviously the later stages you get through, which we're kind of going into now, is it's less about the trajectory and the story. You've got still got to have that kind of big, you know, total addressable market. Otherwise, investors won't be interested. But I think the, the points around the team is that your team's been validated, but also you then recognize the, the areas that you need to build out. So do you need to have, you know, a CMO, a chief marketing officer, because you haven't had a, you know, a, a core marketing function in the business before or, you know, a, a VP of sales or something. Um, and then and then the final bit is around kind of your, um, your traction. So obviously, can you evidence that you've got a model that's scalable, I think is always the question. Um, and actually, in the early stages, you just won't have that. You haven't got a model. You're kind of building a business on sand. But I think as you go through those stages, progressing towards, you know, perhaps a Series A, you need to have something that's repeatable. So it's, it's quite funny. We particularly over the last kind of 12 months or so, we've started to really look into our processes because actually you don't, you know, you don't really know what you do in the early stages. But I think now where we've kind of got a model that feels more repeatable, you're starting to build out a lot of processes that you could then, you know, hand over to a new person who was coming in to kind of, and there's an employee and they could just take you know take the ball and run with it yeah it's yeah. really interesting and i think that's uh, that, that ties into one of the conversations that alex was talking about which is this kind of valley of death so you've kind of got past the the seed stage and you're heading towards this valley of death before you're proving anything and and right there's a whole load of processes that are going to help you through through the valley of death um which which i'm sure people will understand from a tick box perspective andrew what do you, do you um say to to businesses in terms of kind of the prep work and what they should should have ready and models and and i love the concept of building on sand yeah how we make it yeah, foundations yeah. <laughs> yeah um one of the biggest things and a lot of people overlook this is researching who you're approaching for investment mm -hmm. so what it is they want um like i was just on a <clears throat> getting your tech business investment ready something that we were running before this and we had speakers from pd sub P, pwc rays Alex kindly um, contributed a little bit to, um, to there as well. We had people who did the, the founders and all that kind of stuff. And they all require slightly different things. <clears throat> Development Bank of Wales want a business plan. PwC Rays want a kind of pitched document. And um, one of the office, uh, family office guys, they just want a two pager. So it's very, very important to do that. I had, um, back when I was doing my MBA, I was helping a friend tried to raise some money and they went down to London and pitched in front of people and two people got up and walked out in the middle of the pitch and said, we don't invest in tech, you know, so they hadn't done their, they hadn't done the research in there and they put an awful lot of effort into developing that. Yeah. So it's, it's really important to research who you're going to go and find because they all want something slightly different. A really great point. And Richard, how do you think that changes over the course of time? And yeah, how, you know, does, is that completely different by the time you're getting to kind of, series a b c d and 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 then on to public just like with probably many questions in business a lot of things changes but a lot of things stay the same yeah. you know we we've been to the city and we pitched to maybe 60 different investors when we were doing the initial ipo and probably 10 of those investors would have said exactly the same thing we do not invest in early medical life science companies and like well why are we wasting our time and and it's the advisors that you're using would just trying to get you in front of everybody because in case you sparked a bit of interest in them because you know we deal with cancer treatment somebody might have a personal story yeah. but you know ultimately yeah there is there is no there's no hard and fast rule i think it, you know i've been to a private equity round with the bridgepoint guys along along the way that was pitching to five or six big london firms all the big london firms had different ways of looking at things some of them were very much profit driven some of them were very much we're going to leave you alone some of them were very much okay we're going to make sure we, we invest heavily in you to make you the next global superstar it, it it's all about understanding who that investor is and, and finance wales or development bank as of now were a great advocate for creo in the early days because they the yes, they had an observer on the board. Yes, they were helping, but they didn't get too involved in the business. And that's what Creo needed at the time. But other businesses do need more help. Other businesses do need, you know, help with HR, help with IT, help with other things. So 
you've got to try and select that investor that's going to give you the help that you actually need or not give you the help if you want to really run it yourself and, and be hands off. So yeah, you know, absolutely. As Andrew said, you know, understand the investor you're going with, understand their need, understand their wants. And if you don't want somebody to be really horrible and, and, you know, pushing you and forcing you to do every single thing that they want, then make sure you understand that that's what you're going to get in the first place. Cause it's not a nice journey when, when someone is, you know, on you all the time. Well, there speaks the voice of the CFO with experience and <laughs> history. <laughs> well, the other thing I'd say is have a very good CEO above you as well. So if you've got a very good CEO and, and a good CFO, and hopefully they'll say I was a decent one with them, you know, you, you as a pair have got to be joined at the hip. You've got to be going down the same road. You've got to be singing from the same hymn sheet. Whoever, whichever bingo lingo you want to, you want to talk now, you've oh. got to be there. And, and you've brought up two things which we will definitely touch on later. And, and please, if, if I kind of forget, if someone could just give us a nudge and a reminder. So one of those was how to maximise the ongoing relationship and, and make sure that it's a partnership. So and, and we'll come back to this. Um, and then the second was the fact that actually your leadership change, the team probably changes and you may end up with a different CEO but based on different stages of the business. And as a founder, that's not something to be scared of, but actually something to kind of embrace. So we'll definitely come to those those two things. Uh, not connected, Lee, just to make that really critically important. Um, can you talk about timing? Because uh, Richard, I think, talked earlier about, yeah, it takes longer than you expect and it costs more than you're, you're expecting. Talk about timing from your point of view. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think it's it is this that old adage of everything will take twice as long and cost you twice as, you know, and, and cost you twice as much. Um, but actually I think the, the, the biggest thing around timing is um is how do you juggle the existing business that you're running, particularly in the early stages, how do you juggle that with the investment work? So you'll read various things and, and then people will say, you know, take seven weeks out of the business and just kind of go and, you know, pitch everyone. Um, but actually in the reality is if if you were to kind of leave the business for seven weeks then you know would sales start to dry out would the marketing function not get done would the team lose mo lose motivation you know would the product not get developed on time so the reality of it is that you kind of need to juggle it all so from a timing perspective i think you almost need to get your head around the fact that you'll probably end up doing you know five days of your kind of your business work and perhaps your weekend and evenings uh, are kind of you know strategizing around your investment and financial modeling and and that sort of side of things because you know realistically i wish i could take seven weeks off and go off to you know to Silicon Valley and start pitching everyone, but you know it's not really going to happen in the early stages. So, um, so time-wise, I mean, it's it's a really interesting one. I think, and this is just a very ballpark. I think with our with our previous round, I think it took us about just under seven months, and that was a combination of development bank and, and and angels. But I know people that have kind of closed investment in like you know in 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 three months, and I know people that have taken you know almost up to two years. So I think it's kind of almost the better the proposition. Obviously, the quicker you're going to close your round. So. I think that looking back, I perhaps think that we didn't um, we didn't articulate our proposition as clearly as we could have done, and we've learned some lessons as we go into the next sort of round as well. Um, so time is that kind of you know it's a bit like how long's a piece of string and how long are you you know how much are you willing to commit to it? Because I'm sure that if I could have seven weeks, I could probably you know potentially close around in seven weeks. But the reality is, it's probably going to be something that will be you know um, and, you know almost like a little bit more piecemeal over the course of probably you know four to six months. I would have thought. And isn't it interesting because Andrew, I think, was talking earlier about how um, you need to know your investor base and know the investors that you're going after. And the way that you, your value proposition, you position your value proposition in your business in your IM will change depending on those investor bases. Yeah, if I think about yeah, our, our space, yeah, we kind of sit in the future of work space. And if I'm talking to someone who gets the future of work, then they're going to understand our value proposition as we talk about it. But if I'm talking to an angel who's kind of in this for, for either SEIS or EIS purposes, then actually it's a completely different language that we, we use. Otherwise, it sounds like gobbledygook. Um, Andrew, what, what, what do you kind of say to people as they're coming to you for advice? Uh, one of the things I would say, and um, it's kind of come back around quite nicely, is that it's always easier to build a relationship from, with someone when you're not asking for anything specific so yeah. you know research who, who your angel or who your investor might you might like to to kind of to to work with but can you approach them before you're actually looking for money saying look we're building this piece of tech or we're building this product or service or whatever it might be um you know we've kind of we're, we're not looking for any investment yet but we kind of think you you sit in the in the right space would we be able to just have a chat about what we're doing about what your needs and wants are but 
you know, they know you're not looking for anything. So it's an awful lot easier, I find, to get that door open. And I often find as well, if you ask people for help, that their human nature generally wants to be able to help. Um, yeah. And very, very often, or very, very rarely have I ever asked for help and been told straight no. Generally, it might be, okay, I'm a bit busy, but maybe we can do it in a couple of weeks. But I think a lot of people love to do it. And the community in Cardiff is fantastic. I remember when we had our, our little education consultancy company, you know, I learned more in the canteen, the co-working space that we were in than I did on my MBA, you know, from people who were there, who have lived it and who were doing well or who weren't doing too well. So, you know, those kind of, you know, I just can't stress the relationship building element of it. And, and that should be with not only peers and other businesses, but angels are in potential investors as well. Now, Andrew, you and Carl Griffiths have got exactly the same mindset because interestingly, Carl has just posed a question that I think is really important, which is how important do you as a panel think it is to keep in touch with potential investors, even if you're not currently fundraising? Yep. So Andrew, you see, it took the words out of your mouth. Lee, Lee what, did, what have you done? Yeah, kind of, yeah, potential investors. I think it's and that's a really interesting one because you've got you know you've only got a finite amount of time in your day and i think naturally as a, as a ceo you're busy kind of almost running around doing different things um but actually I, it's one of those things that i know is really valuable and perhaps i haven't done enough of it um you know particularly if you're looking at uh, kind of you know vcs being the next round but the good thing is is that there's lots of good networks that you can engage with who can kind of in some ways kind of shortcut that relationship building so if you were to kind of have to send out i don't know sort of 50 Kind of sales navigator linkedin messages to, to to vcs you've identified obviously that's a bit more time consuming but there's you know there's organizations like set squared you know there's you know even development bank can introduce you to vcs even though you might not be looking and actually i agree you know i agree with andrew on this is that you can you can ask people for kind of help and just build those relationships with them and, and most people will be interested to know what you're doing particularly if they're interested in this space um but actually you know it's kind of it's balancing that line from between you know, adding someone to a nurturing newsletter just because it's, and they just get sent a newsletter, which I don't feel is very personal and, and wouldn't really work, through to kind of actually building personal relationships with a smaller group of identified individuals. Uh, and the information is all out there. So if you're looking at VCs, for example, you go onto their websites and it'll tell you what they're kind of, you know, they're, whether they're sector agnostic or whether they're interested in enterprise SaaS or, you know, whatever else it might be. So you can kind of get a good feel for what they're like. You then click on a couple of the key decision makers, get into LinkedIn, have a look at their profiles. Have they done something similar to what you, you know, you're kind of looking to proposition to them? So you can do quite a lot of due diligence from your desk and then just you know, ping them a message and, and kind of go from there and just ask them if you know, interested in finding out a bit more or, or contributing to a particular area of the product that you perhaps don't really need help with, but you could ask them that you need help with. Um, just to engage them. So, so yeah. I think that's, I, I want to pick up on that, Lee, because you, um, you touched very much about that being you doing it and actually very much a founder led piece. And I think as, as businesses grow and Richard and Angela Marie, I think it'd be really interesting to hear, hear your views around, isn't that the role of the board and the Exco as a business grows, does that come away from the founder and become more of the role of, of the board and the Exco? Angela Marie, do you want to lead on yeah, that? Yeah, I think, I think I agree with that. It's the support structures you have around you, isn't it? As you grow, because, you have to, as Lee said, you have to be in the business, but it also does make sense to have those relationships and your board is part of that. They help you, they support you internally with your strategy and they're your eyes and ears in the wider community. So I think, yeah, your board will help you with that as your team grows, absolutely. Richard? Yeah, but I think as well as, well as that, it's building the relationship, not just with potential future investors, but with future advisors as well, because there are specialists out there that, that, that are gonna help now. You know whether that's a a pwc delight type environment or whether it's you know um like a local environment like a gambit or something like that or or, or is something like development bank and certain teams within, within there it's keeping people informed so you know i think we're all in agreement you, you've got to you've got to warm people up for, and it could take six months it could take nine months but, he, but even at, you're at the stage of creo we are now talking to people to raise oh, in our last money raise we we raised it with people that we first went to when we first went to raise money in the city in 2016 you know and we knew that they weren't going to, to put money in in 2016 but in 2019 they were prepared to put in serious chunks of money because we delivered what we said we we're going to do over the last three years so it it is it, in some cases it's a long burn um, and it's the long game but in some cases you know you've just got to you've just got to do it you've just got to um, keep people informed and keep, keep people warmed up to you know where you're going 
So what, what gets ready, what gets a business ready for, or what are the kind of tick points for saying, actually, now it's time for us to go for growth capital? Who wants to run with that? Angela Marie, I'm going to, you're smiling, you never smile, that's <laughs> fake. <laughs> oh, it's a bit of a difficult one, really. I suppose if you're going to be really practical, it might be your cash. You know you're doing something really well. You run and run. You want to run harder. You want to run faster. You model that out, and you see. Well, actually, we need more cash to do that. So you might be led by that. It might be your gut feeling, uh, or just a feeling that you're not reaching out to markets. Um, the same, it might be a part of your a plan, initial plan. So when you did your first raise, you knew that when you got to this point, you were doing your next point. I think there's lots of factors in it, but I think probably the most important thing is to be aware that it's something that may happen and always have it on your radar. And as you grow and develop, I suppose, always, always be looking forward. Where do we go next and how do we get there and what support do we need to get there? Yeah, really interesting. And Andrew, what do you think of the kind of, you know, as, as an organisation that's going, actually, we need to go for some more. We, we, we're ready for our next stage of investment and that's probably growth in some way, shape or form. Might be a new market, which Creo have done or, you know, different, different sectors. What, what would be the kind of tips, tricks and advice that you would give to people who are kind of considering that next stage? Uh, <clears throat> the main one, I suppose, would be, um, <clears throat> can you afford it? As in, you know, is there enough coming in? It's, especially if some, sometimes people might look to do that out of debt, debt round, so they keep more equity in the business and they don't dilute too early because they feel they don't have enough traction or enough yeah. leverage um, or the valuation might be a little bit too low. Um, you know, as, as Richard said, the, the further you are down and, and you know, I, I think it's brilliant that he went and spoke to people in 2016, he had no intention of raising money from, but, you know, <clears throat> Creo were on their radar all the way through and I bet it made that kind of approach in 2019 a lot, lot easier um, mm -hmm. and, and hitting those targets that you set for yourself. Don't try and set targets that are too, too ambitious either, because not only, you know, it doesn't look great when you miss them, but as a founder, it can be really disheartening when you miss them as well. So that whole of setting realistic targets, but you know, the businesses that kind of come at our stage when, when they are quite, when they are quite young, I think a lot of it is, do we need to give up our job or do we need to be able to do this full time? Are we in a position to, without getting themselves into too much financial, financial debt? would be would be it and the other thing is you'll just find that the harder you run the slower you go so you know it just gets harder and harder when you don't have that money and you need to expand your team and you need to bring in someone from sales because you can't warm up investors and be selling all the time and do customer service and maintain your platform so i mean those kind of milestones i suppose that you hit when it gets harder and harder to do what you're doing on your own you need to you need to look at getting funding in to, to increase your team really and that lends itself into really nicely into the kind of the personal side of fundraising and kind of looking after your own as a, a as part of the key leadership team whether you're a founder or whether you're on the leadership team yeah how do you you balance the the stuff that just needs doing yeah. um versus it uh, versus looking after yourself um and uh, again, Andrew, it's probably interesting to explore this because you, you you see it perhaps from the outside looking in. Um, so if, if we can explore it with you, and then Lee, if we can do it from a you know kind of still in the thick of it, um, you know, real driver of the business, and then Richard as as part of the full team that does it. If it I think that would be quite interesting to explore it like that. So Andrew, what do you see looking in? Well, I, I think it's quite interesting given the current circumstances with the pandemic and the lockdown that a lot of people who never founded a business have kind of found out what it's like trying to found a business when you're trying to juggle the family at home and the work and you're spreading like six hours of work over like 24 or 12 or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done, um, you know, I've, I've had the, the couple of businesses I did, not on the level that, that, that the other guys have had them, um, but it was never my intention to, to grow. So I think knowing how far you want to go with it and what you want to do is, is very, very important. But juggling that time aspect is, is, is really, really difficult. And, you know, sometimes, you know, there's, there's a lot of research out there saying that multitasking isn't the best thing in the world because you do a lot of jobs kind of half okay whereas rather than focusing on one or two um you know which is which is quite important um and i think it's at that point that that you need to build a team and i try and encourage people to build a team at, a, at the earliest possible stage as well because um you find like-minded people with different skill sets who all want to push and pull in the in the same direction will make a massive difference down the line um with the cone delegation and giving people their their kind of roles and responsibilities and letting them carry those out 
Lee, how many hours of the day are there? <laughs> not, not enough. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, you know, we, we chose this path, so we kind of, you know, we can't really be, uh, can't really moan about it too much. But I think it's a, it's a really interesting thing, because if you read all the kind of the management textbooks and you kind of, you know, you, you get this idea of a, of a leader of, a, of an organisation or a company being a certain kind of stereotypical image, and, um, and I think the reality of it is really different. I think actually most people are kind of, you know, doing the best they can and working as many hours as they can to kind of, you know, to, to kind of keep you know, their heads above water and, the, you know, and keep their team in, in, in jobs. And rather than the kind of being wild visionaries that you perhaps kind of see, see on TV and films and, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs and Elon Musk and everybody else. So, but actually I think um, it, it can be quite a lonely place because obviously you don't necessarily want to reveal um, your concerns to uh, to your team because they may get worried and you know when a senior personnel member might leave or you don't want to reveal it to your family because actually you don't want them to worry about you um, and equally you know you may not want to reveal it to, to your board because they may lose faith in you so you kind of always need to be this kind of um, this sort of tough character that can handle it all and actually I, I think I'm a bit different I think everyone that knows me you know they, they know that I'm, I, I'd rather be a bit more vulnerable than actually kind of necessarily be something that you're not um, but jug juggling everything is is difficult, mm -hmm. but I think the good thing is you get good, and I agree with Andrew on this, you get good people around you and almost every hire that you have, almost the burden is some, <laughs> somehow reduced. Yeah. And, uh, and then it's about delegation and there's something again that naturally, you know, as a founder, you don't tend to be very good at, I'm certainly not very good at it, um, but you start to delegate things. And again, you just feel that weight starting to lift. And that's how things start to grow because you can end up being, you know, the barrier to growth. If you're kind of, mm keeping everything in and you're kind of trying to control everything too tightly then obviously you could end up being the constraint to the growth so it's almost understanding what your weaknesses are and I know that I've got plenty and then kind of building the capabilities around that that align you to with you know with where you want to be um, you know we very much talking about recruitment we very much recruit on values so you know we believe that you can learn technical capabilities of course course you know with software it's slightly different but you know if it's marketing or something else you can learn a lot of those capabilities but aligning the values to where the business wants to be and with the purpose of the organization is really important we found that to be really key yeah, one of the um one of our clients i'm really lucky we work with a, a private equity client which gives us kind of insight actually into the pe side of things um which is probably why we do the work if i'm completely honest it's it's kind of it gives us some um good insight in what the tick boxes are they want to see uh, moving forward but yesterday we were running a webinar for them and at 5 30 yesterday morning i was having a linkedin conversation with somebody else that was going to be on the panel who's the ceo of a um a business that's kind of just about to go public um and and both of us didn't think it's 5 30 in the morning this is abnormal yeah it was just kind of oh he's online let's have a conversation and i think that i think that's quite interesting when we talk about the kind of personality and well-being and mental health um and and how every day just starts and ends at different times but how important it is to make sure that that pressure doesn't go through to your team and and that there's not an expectation that your team is going to do the same thing um, and that leads nicely into Richard. So Richard, uh, you know, have you felt at 5.30 in the morning that you should be should be there and doing things? Or, or actually, does it never go away? Uh, probably never goes away. Um, depends on how many time zones you're actually working across at any one point in time and how big the business is. Um, you know, uh, the, both Andrew and then Lee have said, it's, it's building the, the team around you to, to help you to deliver. You know, ultimately, at the lower stage, the CEO, if they've got a, a finance person or a, or a you know a part-time CFO working with them, they're going to carry all the burden. And I think Lee said earlier on, you're working weekends, you're working after hours. You know, you you, you can't put the business away for seven weeks. If if you put it aside for seven weeks, then there will be no business. So, you know, even when we did the big MBO at, at SPTS, myself and Kevin just left the business, carry on running. We had to run the business as it would normally because day one post doing a big private equity deal, they're expecting you to turn out the same level of revenue you were the previous day. So you can't put it aside, but yeah, you, you've got to build a good team. You, you've got to keep the culture as well. Uh, Craig was the CEO at, um, at Creo, was very keen at when we were 20 to 30 people, we've got the same culture as we, we have at 80 to 90 to 100 people. It is, it's difficult, it's not going to be exactly the same, but you've got to try and keep that culture going through and you know if you're looking to bring people in you can bring people in from from big blue chip companies but they may have a different 
ethos and culture to someone who's you know nimble and and when there's like minus you know there's less than 20 people in the organization they're going to think differently they have different controls they're not going to be as nimble so when you're bringing those type of people in you've got to be careful you don't just completely kill the culture that, that's already working there so yeah it, it, it's not easy it's never going to be easy there's no right fix there's no right person to bring in um but it's all the hard work and effort that the ceo I can say CEO and CFO level, but you know CEO in particular. It's both, isn't it? Yeah, we, we know that, and and I think it's interesting that um, Creo was founded by uh, Professor Chris Hancock. Comes up yeah. right and saying, and actually, um, yeah, now has a different CEO. And so, if we, I'd like to explore that kind of changing roles um, and and changing in leadership teams as you go through a fundraise, and whether that whether it matters um, as, a, as a founder or whether or not actually you recognize where your weaknesses are and say, you know, I'm still involved, this is still a cracking business, but actually I'm not necessarily the right person to be at the helm or doing X or doing Y. Andrew Marie, have you seen that in the businesses that you've worked with historically? To some extent, yes. Um, and it's, it's a funny one really, and it, it feeds into what Richard was saying about culture. Because I think the kind of people who are able to know how they influence culture and how they spread it out amongst the people that they bring in are also seem to have a higher level of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. So they're actually able to say, well, okay, yes, I am. I, I have to stop here. I need to get someone in who's stronger at me in this and, and has that sort of vision or that way of looking or can take, you know, the, the business that I've got to 5 million to 10 million. But then you get other people who don't seem to have that level of awareness um, and yeah they don't it, 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 it's so it's so multifaceted really isn't it um, and those people don't want to they find it harder to let go and then perhaps the culture that they've developed is less open to change yeah. and therefore trying to make that change then you you have issues with the board it, it, it can be, I think it's, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be so diplomatic here. But, I think <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you've just got to go, you know what, it's not me, haven't you? And, yeah, and, yeah. and, and actually this, I think, leads into, um, nicely, because I should get told off on timing, otherwise it leads nicely into how you maximise the relationship that you have with your investors. Um, because, you know, at some point, your, your investors might be going, actually, you're not the right person to be at the helm. Um, and if you've built a great relationship throughout that process, that's not tough to hear, right? Uh, yeah. But if it comes as a surprise and something's happened through that partnership. So perhaps we could go, and I'm, I'm actually going to do a round robin, which I hate doing. Um, but if you could come up with your kind of top tip or trick for um, getting the most out of your investment panel, I think that might be my hint from Carl. If you could come up with your top um trick for getting the most out of your investors that would be fantastic i don't know who wants to run with that first okay i'm going to pick on lee sorry lee um right. so so how do you get the maximum out of your uh, out of your investment i think just be really open and transparent with your ask i yeah. think so if they don't know and they don't know what's happening in the business they won't be able to help you and um, just as a quick tip we run um investor group meetings we haven't run one recently because of obviously COVID, but um, we tend, we run them every six months. So basically we update on progress, but also we ask them something at the end. It's like, you know, we ask them for whatever strategic barriers we've got or blockers we've got, we, we ask them openly um, and they help us with that as well. And they follow up uh, post, post the group. Yeah, perfect. Angela Marie. Um, echoing what Lee said, really put your arms around your investors. They're important. They came in on board because they believed in you and they trusted you. Give them that back. Yeah let them understand the difficulties you're having, ask them for advice, and you'll find that they'll be there for you. Super. Andrew, I'm going to come to you next, because I think we're still then kind of in the, in the growth phase before yeah. we then come to Richard. Yeah, I, I think, it, again, it goes back to that relationship, um, being honest with the investor at the earliest possible point. Um, generally, if the investor comes in and puts 100, 150, 200K into the business, um, more often than not, if they're going to be active investors, their experience and their knowledge is probably worth more than the money. The money gets you over certain hurdles and, you know, it, it fulfills certain needs. But, you know, the earlier that you identify a problem and you share it, uh, and again, you know, that 
uh, problem shared is a problem half. There could be a lot of things that they could do to, um, to stop any issues down the line. So keeping an open, honest communication with them and at the earliest possible stage is definitely the best rather than kind of putting your head in the sand um, and, um, and hoping something goes away. Thank you. And Richard, um, by the time we start getting to grown up investors, meant in the nicest possible way, um, how does that change? What should we be doing to maximise our relationship with them? I, I don't think it's much different whether, whether they are, you know, your so-called grown up investors or, or angels or, or, you know, just family investors. You, you just got to keep them informed. Um, you know, Creo were doing something every sort of six months, um, a bit similar to what Lee said. Uh, you know, we, we made sure that people were aware where the horizons were coming. So it's 18 months until we need cash. And it's still 18 months until we need cash. So, you know, every time we, we publicize something, it was when is the next event or uh, investor horizon going to be coming? What are the milestones to get to that investor horizon? Um, but at the same time, we also got a group of investors to have a observer on the board as well. So that person then had the responsibility of going back to that group of investors and telling them what the plans were. So it took a bit of the pain and pressure off us to constantly have, you know, emails, phone calls, conversations. So you were focusing them on, on maybe one or two individuals rather than, you know, 25, 30 individual investors. What a great piece of advice. And I think um, I'll, I'll wrap up because Cole's given me my, my very obvious clue, which is um, be quiet now, Alison. Um, but I think as a wrap up, um, uh, we our investors should be partners i think it's really easy as founders through a business to to think of an investor not as a partner but actually they want you to succeed as much as you want to succeed because that's what's going to drive their returns um and i think if we all take the approach that says that's why we should go for investment um, and that's how we should work with our partners and as lee said we should ask for help when we need it because they've been there and they've done it and if not they know someone who has then that's a great position to be to be in. So um, that leads us nicely into 12.31, so I shall get my wrist slapped slightly. Um, but a massive thank you to all the panellists, to Lee, to Angela Marie, to Richard and to Andrew um, for joining us today and sharing your experience um, as founders and as touch points in with founders um, and through the stages of funding. So many thanks all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole, over to you. Thanks so much, Alison. And uh, what a great panel discussion that was. I think that could have gone on and on and on for so much longer. We would have kept getting more brilliant insight out of it. But unfortunately, we do have to stop there. Um, so a huge thanks to all of our speakers today. Um, they've been absolutely brilliant. And to you, the audience, for, for joining us. And um, we'll share the slides and the video as quickly as we can afterwards. Um, and just to say, you know, please do get in touch with us at DevBank. We're actively looking for deals. So you can get in touch with us individually direct or via our website. Um, we've done, in fact, in the first 10 weeks of lockdown, we continued to, to be active in our investing and completed 10 deals in 10 weeks. Uh, we're one of the top five most active VCs in the UK in its entirety. So um, if you are looking for investment or just looking for some, uh, some advice, please do get in touch. Okay, so uh, that's it for now. Um, thanks so much and um, have a fantastic